Rick J.S. Polka, co-founder and chairman of JT Strategic Communications. And I am really, really pleased to be joined today by my longtime friend, former Clinton White House Press Secretary, Mike McCurry, uh, who also had a lengthy tenure as co-chair of the Nonpartisan Commission on Presidential Debates. Mike is now a distinguished professor and director of the Center for Public Theology at Wesley Theological Seminary, where his work focuses on the intersection of faith, politics, and public affairs. Mike also serves of counsel at Public Strategies Washington, where he provides counsel on communication strategies and management to a wide range of corporate and nonprofit clients. Mike, uh, I thought we would be starting today talking about last night's VP debate, and of course we'll get there in a minute, but uh, you know, as has been the case through much of uh, 2020, uh, things change at an alarming pace. And so just this morning, your uh, commission uh, on presidential debates said, well, you know, the town hall debate that's due to be uh, the next presidential next week is uh, gonna be virtual, Biden accepted, uh, President Trump said, no way, I'm not showing up if it's going to be virtual. So now what? Breaking news. We always <laughs> have breaking news. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. You know, the, the, Donald Trump is such a mercurial guy that I think his position on this may change five times in the next week anyhow. So I'm not sure that we ought to <clears throat> make any conclusions right now. But the state of play, as you and I are talking right at this moment, is that um, you know there will be a virtual debate. Uh, Trump has said, "I don't want to participate in a virtual debate." Uh, he's being asked to do so because he is infected with the disease, and he could infect others and anyone else who comes into contact with him. But the, the man apparently has no concern about that or concern for the other people he might come into contact with. So he wants to show the way he wants to run it. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Now, I'm not a good uh, prognosticator on things like this, but I think what will happen is that they will have to postpone the October 15th debate and then shift it to the October 22nd debate. And we'll probably end up with only, you know, two more debates, one of them a town hall style, we hope, and then the last debate, which would be October 29th. But uh, it's, it's very hard to determine right now because I think this is a shifting landscape on us. Yeah, it seems to be the uh, rule of the day, shifting uh, landscape. And um, so something that I've never seen in my lifetime in politics, uh, right after the first presidential debate, uh, you know, I, I was watching it on CNN and there's Dana Bash, coming right out of the debate saying, I don't know what to call this. It was a shit show. Now, I will tell you, I've never heard that uh, by a senior anchor correspondent uh, on live TV, but it probably accurately described that debate. I think most of us felt that way. Yeah. How, so how would you characterize, if that was the case for the presidential, how would you characterize last yeah. night's debate? You know, you and I have been in a lot of those spin rooms after the presidential debates, and you know what a circus environment that is, and people say some wild and crazy things, but I think that's about the over-the-top thing I've ever heard, but I don't think it was inaccurate. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think it was, you know, uh, it's not that there should be decorum and these should be boring and we should, you know, always listen to lots of long rehearse speeches and one-liners by the candidates. But there is some obligation to show up and sort of say, you know, this is a, a, about a respectful moment in the history of our democracy. And it's about choosing a president. And I take that seriously. And, and even though I'm going to have disagreements and probably get into arguments with my opponent, uh, we still respect the dignity in the office of the presidency at the end of the day. And that didn't happen. And it didn't happen. And, you know, I'm a partisan guy. You know, I, I know you are too. I, I don't want to be overly partisan here. But it, the responsibility falls on one person who misbehaved in that debate. 
And I think, you know, Biden had his moments where he got like a little hot under the collar, no question. Uh, but Donald Trump just is incapable of showing up and respecting any of the institutions that make our democracy function. I mean, he, he has kind of consciously obliterated a lot of the things that really provide continuity and stability in our government. And uh, I, I find that very, very troubling. And I, you know, I hope, look, I hope a lot of people who voted for him in 2016 say, look, we wanted to, we, we wanted to shake politics up. We wanted to vote for a guy who was different, who was, came out, didn't come out of the classic political mode because we're so tired of hearing these stale politicians talk to us. So let's take a, you know, let's, let's go in a different direction and try somebody who would bring something different to the office. Well, we tried it and it didn't work. <laughs> and so I just hope, you know, a lot of people, I mean, this won't be true of the core, you know, hardcore Trump supporters, but I hope some of the people who are on the margins who maybe were, you know, what we would call moderate Republicans or something like that, who voted for him will say, you know, we've got to do something different. Now they may not want to go all the way over and vote for Joe Biden, but, uh, you know, maybe they'll find other alternatives where they can participate and express an opinion without voting for uh, the current incumbent president. So if there are additional debates, if, if if uh, they can reach some agreement and there are debates to come in October, later in October, is there any reason to really believe that Trump will behave differently? And unless you're willing to shut off the microphone, <laughs> just cut him off. Well, you know, he, he is, he, for all you can say about the guy, he's very good at re reading uh, TV reviews. And he knows how to kind of track public opinion and what people have said. And so he knows that he did not get high marks for his debate performance in the first debate. So my guess is he will show up and have a different style. He'll still be as pugilistic as he ever is. But I think he will probably figure out a reality TV way to kind of adjust what it looked like in the first debate. I mean, I don't know. You, you, you're, you know, Rick. You're really good at this stuff too. What do you think? I, you know, it, it. I, well, first of all, I thought that Dana's characterization was right on target, and you know, and 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 indeed, that phrase got used literally in a lot of the analyses that that, that followed. I just don't know that he is capable. You're, you're right about him being the showman being the reality TV person, but I'm not sure that he's going to be able to control himself. It seems like, you know, if, if, if Biden says something, it's almost like, uh, you know, you're, you're throwing chum in the water and you know that the shark is going to come. Yeah. You know, you, you and I have participated in debate preparation yep. exercises for candidates for president on down. And I don't know, I mean, that would be an utter waste of time if you're trying to do debate prep with Donald Trump, because it's not going to, none of it will stick. It's going to all be whatever he's kind of on the spur of the moment uh, thinks about. And so you won't have any kind of sense. There's no way to lay out any kind of game plan on, well, what are our objectives in this debate? Or what do we want to really try to accomplish against uh, Joe Biden in this debate? I mean, there's there's no way of predicting that because it's going to be whatever Trump makes up at the last minute on his mind. And it, it might be fascinating. It might be entertaining. It might even be marginally productive and helpful for the country, although I have, have severe doubts about that. But uh, it's going to be what it is, <laughs> whatever it is. And that's, that, <laughs> that's what we'll be in for. Yeah, I mean, well, he, he used that term about the... Uh... Uh, pandemic, it is what it is. And uh, I think a lot of people are uh, using that term uh, a lot more these days because it describes a lot of what's going on right now. Uh, right. Right. I, there's been a lot of, uh, and I was a little, one thing I was surprised at, a lot of criticism of Chris Wallace uh, as the moderator of the debate. I, I had a different take on it. I mean, I, it's the guy tried mightily uh, to you know, say, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, 
or, or to push them to be responsive and sort of going up there and, uh, you know, throwing a sack over his head. I, I'm not exactly sure what, what people could reasonably expect Chris Walls to do as long as Trump was doing what he was doing. Well, uh, a couple of things. He's a, first of all, he's a good guy. He prepares very hard for these debates. Um, <clears throat> the history of his moderating the debate four years ago was that Fox News, there's a thing called the network pool. I mean, and people need to understand that, that they're, the major networks collaborate and uh, share the technical uh, problems of putting on these debates because not all five networks want to pay for five different cameras, so they share their resources. And so they have a pool. They, they pool their resources. And um, Fox News, which is a member, the members are ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, and Fox. And Fox News, uh, I think, legitimately said, look, we've never had one. We're in the pool. And all the other networks have had one of their talent moderating one of these debates. And we, you know, d deserve to have an opportunity to have someone from Fox moderating a debate. And we considered that argument and felt that it was a legitimate argument, uh, just based on how we do our work and how we engage with the pool. So uh, we asked, you know, Fox for their recommendation. And <clears throat> they really, they you know, they had, they had two recommendations, uh, Chris Wallace and then Brett Baer. Brett Baer, I think, by the way, is a very talented journalist. I would not be surprised if he moderates a presidential debate someday. But Chris came into the role and we thought did a very credible job in 2016. And I think he did a very credible job in trying to, right. you know, hold on to things in this first presidential debate. But, it, you know, at, at the end, it's not about the moderator. And the, the Commission on Presidential Debates, which I was a part of, we don't set the agenda. We don't inform, you know, we don't decide what the content it is. It's really up to the moderator. But at the end of the day, it's up to the candidates. Do the candidates show up ready to engage with each other authentically and debate and have discussion? And clearly in the first presidential debate, that, that did not happen. Now, I was more mildly relieved that watching the vice presidential debate between Kamala Harris and Michael Pence, uh, that there was a little more modicum of normalcy <laughs> that was introduced. I mean, they still had their moments, but it, it looked more like what we would think of as this is the way a debate should happen. There's good, you know, contested argument. There are moments of anger. There are moments of, you know, some uh, inspiration. Uh, but it, it, it looked more like what I hope we get more of as we go through the debates to come. The, the going to the VP debate, the one thing, Mike, that, that sort of bothered me, there, there was certainly more civility and more decorum. Um, and I don't know, I mean, both of them, uh, you know, deflected certain questions. Uh, um, and Vice President Pence completely ignored one of the questions. Uh, but it, it was uh, a civil conversation most of the time but there, there was never an did they try to cover too many topics because there was never really a follow-up where you actually were able to sort of go into one of the answers and and dig out more and so i you know what you got was their sort of top line responses and no probing beyond that and i'm wondering if yeah. that was you know because trying to cover eight different or whatever number of topics they ended up breezing through. Well, you, you can see that the flow of the debate was as Susan Page, the moderator, tried to move to a new subject. Both candidates were thinking in their minds, there's something I have to clear up from the last exchange that we had moments ago. So they kept wanting to go back and replay the tape from a previous question. And, you know, that that is a, a, a time-honored technique in debate preparation that you don't leave anything on the table that goes unanswered. Because if you left something, uh, you know, the question before that you did not answer, then it sticks. 
And so you've got to go back and try to fix that, even if it means that you're off topic on whatever the question is. Um, it, but the simple technique and the, the one that you know we've used or I've used a lot doing a lot of debate prep is you get the question, you say, that's a very good question. My answer is yes, no, maybe. Uh, here's what I would do in 10 seconds. And said, but that said, I want to go back. <laughs> you know, so you have to you have to give the audience the confidence that you've answered the question or at least tried to provide a direct answer before you then try to change the subject. And what we say, pivot. Pivot is the word that's often used. Pivot back to something else that you want to talk about. And I. I don't think they that was a practice technique in the debate last night. I think you need, you know, you need to deal with the question on the table, make it clear that you're responsive to what the moderator has asked, even if you want to basically give a brief answer to the question and move on to something that else that you want to talk about. I mean, I, I, I mean that's a that that is like in debate preparation. That's like debate preparation 101. That's one of the things that you really concentrate and work on. Yeah, so what was your, uh, you know, did you feel that there was a winner last night or um, was the big takeaway that it was just more civil? Well, I, I mean, my, my problem is I always see this through a lens of a, obviously a very partisan Democrat. And I remember during the course of the debate, I said to my wife, she came downstairs at one point because she's, she has limited tolerance for a lot of this stuff. And I said, I think she's crushing it. I think she's doing a great job. You know, I, so I, I, I was declaring Kamala the winner in my head, but does that bear out? Is that really accurate? Is that really the way most Americans saw it? Is that, you know, to the degree we get any kind of genuine public opinion research on what people actually thought, or maybe Frank Luntz was somewhere running focus groups, <laughs> you know, who knows? <laughs> but, uh, you know, there'll, there'll, be, there'll be some data that will come out in the next day or two to see what happens. But I thought, I thought she was engaging and she has an appealing personality on the debate stage. You know, she smiles and she kind of shakes her head. And I, I, I thought she was respectful but disdainful of Michael Pence. And she got the right balance there. And I, I think that was very, very important. Pence is just kind of an automaton. And, uh, you know, <laughs> the only, you know, the, I don't know if, if the people watching this, the whole episode with the fly landing on his hair. Yeah. <laughs> which, which is, and I, it, you know, it's just begging. I, I, I said, Kamala Harris, just, you know, Turn to Pence, Pence and say, your fly's open. <laughs> <laughs> that, would have been, that would have been a killer moment. <laughs> that would have been a killer moment. Well, as it is, um, as you may have said, I mean, there's like all sorts of memes now on uh, social media. <laughs> it, 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 it says something about where we are when the, the big highlight from last night, and in fact, you'll even, if you Google a highlight from VP debate, you'll see the video with the fly sitting on his, on his head. Yeah, but you know, that, I mean, Rick, that's, a, that's an interesting <laughs> point because think back in your memory, you've been around doing this for a long time, me too. You know, your memory of these debates are not the substantive arguments that are made. It's those personal moments, those things that give you a glimpse into the character of the candidate. I mean, you can figure out what their stance is on you know, the liberation of Eastern Europe, but what you're going to remember are the gaffes, or you're going to remember, you know, George H.W. Uh, Bush looking at his watch, figure, you know, because, you know, not because he wanted to check and see how much time do I have left in this thing, but it looked like, you know, the way it was read was that I want to get out of here because get I'm- Get the hell out, right, yeah. You know? And so it, it's those, those personal moments, it's with Bill Clinton, standing up and approaching that woman on stage and, you know, doing the whole, I feel your pain thing for the first time. Um, th those are the memorable moments that we take away from this. Now, that may not be the greatest way to evaluate these debates, but I think there is something, there's a combination of 
you know, you people watch these debates to sort of say, I've already made up my mind. You know, there are very few people who are undecided who watch these right. debates. So they watch the debates to sort of say, here's why I'm confident that I've made the right choice. Here's what I think my candidate for president will do if they get elected. Here's the agenda that they would pursue that I'm in favor of. And I want to hear more about that agenda. I want to hear what they're going to do uh, when they get elected. They, they, they're not looking for persuasion. They're looking for conviction. And they really want to make you know, sure that they've made the right choice. And they want to be enthusiastic about it. And that's, you know, that, that's the best that we can offer through these debates, I think. Kamala Harris. So now, uh, you know, we had uh, four years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, we had um, Hillary Clinton and Trump. Um, and, you know, clearly there is a, seems to be a different standard that women uh, are held to, um, you know, and so, uh, you know, you had Harris last night and I thought she made a strong impression. Uh, I thought she was in command. I thought she did a good job. I, like Pence, she deflected a little bit on a couple of the questions too, like uh, the Green New Deal. Uh, and he completely deflected on uh, uh, pre-existing conditions. I mean, he, he never even answered that question at all. But are women, in your view, held to a different standard? It sure seems so. Uh, in terms of the, some of the evaluation that comes in afterwards? Well, look, I think there are a lot of changes happening in our politics right now. I mean, we're going through this massive demographic change in the country. And white males are no longer going to be the dominant factor in our national politics. In fact, white people are going to not be dominant. And... Uh, you know, college educated white people are going to have, <laughs> you know, their influence is going to decline. And we're going to see because of the diversity of the country, more Hispanic, more women, more Latinx, you know, more Asian people participating in our national conversation. And I think that's part of what was going on last night. It's not just because she was a woman, it's because she is a woman of color. And she comes from a different kind of background. And she's not, you know, we, we, we are getting used to seeing someone other than, you know, a very boring looking white guy. Not to say that that's what Mike Pence looked like, but, you know, he looked like your conventional presidential candidate that we've seen for the last 40 years or so. And Kamala Harris was something totally different. And people have to adjust to that. And some people will be excited about that. There will be a portion, and I think this is kind of the core of Trump's support, who are very bothered by that because they feel like they're losing a country that they fought for and believed in and really supported. And now it's being taken away by all these new elements that are entering into the equation. And I think, you know, I think women on the stage is part of that transition. And Hillary went through it. Kamala Harris went through it last night. But, you know, we're, you know it, it, we're getting to the point where it's a little tough not to believe that, you know, we're seeing women, uh, that gender is becoming less important in when we make executive decisions. Um, and I, I think there's still, you know, anxiety that that provokes in some elements of the population. You and I are happen to be talking right now where there's this weird story about uh, the the governor of Mich Michigan. Uh, Michigan, Gretchen uh, Whitmer, being, being uh, threatened with a kidnapping, you know, and um, we just we just have to assume that there we have to have institutions that provide some uh, you know continuity and some grace and some measure of, you know, civil discourse in the way in which we are going to conduct our politics. And where do we look to get those kinds of institutional factors that will help us? And, and how do we strengthen those institutions and not tear them down? I mean, I think that's a primary project for 
our little experiment in American democracy as we go forward for the next several years. Yeah, well, boy, I tell you, I feel it. I, you know, uh, blessedly have uh, six grandchildren, uh, four girls and two boys. And I worry, I mean, you know, I, I got an interest in politics, uh, Mike, when I was still a kid, when I was a teenager. And, um, uh, you know, it, it has been a large part of my life, but I, I for the first time, I'm, I'm actually concerned about the future uh, for our grandkids uh, because of just how uh, nasty uh, public discourse has become, how uncivil. And, and I, you know, I'm not uh, naive. It's not like uh, I have ignored the fact that other, there have certainly been other very uh, strident presidential campaigns and strident language and even strident moments in debates, but it is um, all encompassing right now. And it actually bothers me quite a bit. Well, look, look, uh, <clears throat> I don't want to go into the dark side too much, but yeah, you're right. like you, I, I was a young kid in 1968. That was my first presidential campaign that I worked in. I worked in, I was growing up in California and I volunteered in the California Democratic primary in 1968 to work for Bobby Kennedy because I really thought Bobby Kennedy was my candidate. Now, you know, but most everyone probably watching this remembers that that night he was shot and murdered. And I remember I had I'd gotten up early in the morning to hang out door leaflets. And so I'd gone to bed early after we watched Kennedy's victory speech. And then I went to bed and my parents had to come in and tell me the next morning that he had been shot and critically shot. And he of course lingered and then didn't die until later in the day. But that's a reminder to us that politics can be a lot worse <laughs> sometimes than what we are going through now. And the consequences can be much more grievous. And I think back to 1968 about just how unhinged the country was in that year. And we managed to make it through that. We managed to recover. Now, not everyone would agree with the direction that we went from there, but our democracy was endurable. And we lasted through some of the most difficult times that we ever experienced. So even if you and I have concern about where we are and we're worried about the future of the country, we know that there's some you know, quality of endurance that we have in this democracy that will carry us through. And we will make it through. It just may take longer than you and I would want to see happen. Yeah. I, I, uh... 68 was my first foray into presidential politics, too. I was with Gene McCarthy as his national uh, uh, press coordinator. And, uh, and I believe there was a gentleman by the name of John Podesta, who we both know, who was working for McCarthy out, out in California, uh, as, as I recall. So, right. Yep, goes back a long way. But you're right. Let's look ahead. So I've heard um, some people talk about the fact that um, like political conventions, debates, these presidential debates are a thing of the past. And I think people are reacting to, you know, what's happened, the, the tone and the tenor. Uh, I find it hard to believe uh, that debates are gonna go away because they play, to me, a pretty pivotal role uh, in election campaigns. But um, I wonder what thoughts you have about that. And will there have to be some rules changes considered at least by the debate commission? Well, you know, a little bit of history first. Remember, we had <clears throat> the famous Kennedy-Nixon debate, and then we really didn't have debates for a long time after that because they would they would always have candidates debating each other about whether they were going to have debates rather than right. sitting down and actually have them. Right. And I think partly because in 1980, Jimmy Carter skipped out of two presidential debates. Uh, the Commission on Presidential Debates was formed saying, look, we should guarantee that the American people see our major candidates for president, Democrat, Republican, independent, if they, you know, they've got enough support, 15 percent to be on the stage. And you know, and that and that's that's an expectation of our democracy, not that it's something that is a, 
you know, it's a little grace moment that we have. It's like we expect our candidates to show up and talk to each other and to talk about the future of the country, to tell us what they're going to do if they get elected. And that has become now, it's the great accomplishment, I think, of the Commission on Presidential Debates is that has become an expectation. And so when a candidate comes along and says, well, maybe I won't participate in these debates, and people say, what? You know, that's that's not the way it works. You're supposed to get up there and debate. You know, we're supposed to have debates. And so the expectation is that there will be debates now rather than it's something that you wait and see if it's actually going to happen. And I think that's a big change in the way in which we've kind of structured the presidential uh, general election process because people sort of know that these debates are significant moments. And I I think it's very hard. I think it would be very hard for Trump to try to duck out of these debates. And I understand, you know, that we, we as we are talking now, there's a back and forth because, you know, Trump is sick and people don't want to be around a candidate who is sick and they don't want to get infected. So they're trying to figure out some way to wrestle with that and deal with that. And, you know, they've prepared opposed to maybe doing it by virtual means, and that's not going to look like that's not going to work, you know, but but who knows, but I, I do know this, between now and November 3rd, the American people expect to see Joe Biden and Donald Trump debating each other. Uh, now, I think they probably expect to see it in person, and maybe it has to be done with plexiglass between them or however, you know, they did the vice presidential debate, but they expect to see these candidates talk about the future of the country and challenge each other and speak authentically about where they would lead if they got elected. And I think that's a beautiful thing that we've got to figure out how we preserve one way or another. I don't think these are anachronistic moments. I mean, this is a relatively new feature in our presidential politics that we've actually guaranteed that there will be presidential debates. And I think it's important for people to see their candidates having a conversation and talking about the future of the country because that's the you know it it, it helps them understand what what is going to happen in my life and my family's life as we think ahead to the next four or eight years the the there's been a fair amount of buzz about the the notion that the commission should adopt a shut off the microphone uh policy um, you know, you heard that um, right after uh, the presidential, the first presidential, and, you know, even even though last night was civil, I, you, you still hear some buzz about are they going to do the shut off the mic. I'm just curious, and, you know, if you think that's a, a good idea, a bad idea, um, you know, or is it just, is it just relevant now because of uh, the current president's unique style of debating? Well, the, the utility, I mean, the, the importance of the commission may, making a decision to get away from these highly structured environments where you say, okay, you have two minutes to speak to this question and then Senator so-and-so, you get one minute to respond, and then you get, you know, 15 seconds to rebut, and then it's, it's you know, highly regimented and regulated like that. And we got away from that because that, it, it, it began to feel like people were just practicing their sound, life, sound bites and turning it into sort of a rolling press conference, and we wanted more conversation between the candidates. So that's why the, the commission in 2016 elected to move to these blocks of time in which the moderator would introduce a topic, each candidate would get to speak for two minutes, and then there was supposed to be discussion and dialogue back and forth between the candidates, not the moderator trying to make things happen, but the candidates talking to each other about where they agreed and disagreed. And to be honest, it sounded great. I'm not sure, you know, not certain that that's worked out well because we can see, and we saw in the first presidential debate, how that process can be utterly hijacked and then turn into a free for all that doesn't you know leave anyone more enlightened than when they tuned in in the first place so i think there will have to be a little more structure built in i don't know since i'm no longer on the commission i don't know what they're actually thinking about i don't know what the campaigns would agree to you know because they, they they've got to you know if there's going to be more structure built in they've got to sort of 
uh, abide by whatever the, the rules are going to be. But I, I think decorum and dignity and respecting the fact that we are choosing the president of the United States of America, which is a pretty important thing, is something that ought to elevate the discussion for all, for everybody uh, involved. And I, I do think that we, we got, a, I think, a much better vice presidential debate than the first presidential debate, obviously, last night. Oh, so maybe, oh, we, yeah. maybe we can kind of keep things going in the right direction. I, I cannot let this conversation end without at least one question about uh, White House press secretary because, uh, and I, I admit I may be a little biased on the issue, but to me, you you were perhaps one of the great all-time White House press secretaries. Uh, uh, just uh, in terms of your your uh, your you flattered me unnecessarily. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I mean, I really I really felt, and I got to see it. Uh, you know, on a daily basis on all the trips that we did together all around the world. Um, and um, I, I'm wondering if you could talk about sort of the changing, clearly there's been a changing role style of the White House press secretary. And then maybe just to close, is there one anecdote that you remember that was, was like, sort of like the craziest thing when you were White House press secretary? You know, the role is important because it's an action enforcing event. This is something that the Trump people just did not understand from the beginning, that the preparation for that briefing requires people throughout government to come up with good answers. So I would go to Bill Clinton in the morning and go to Leon Panetta, our chief of staff, and go with my briefing book and say, okay, here's what, here's the guidance, as we call it. Here's what the suggested answers are to the questions. And I remember, I remember one time President Clinton, pardon me if I can't say this on air, but he said, well, that's just bullshit. <laughs> and, then, and I said, well, yeah, but that's our policy. <laughs> and so he would, you know, he'd pick up the phone and he'd, call cabinet secretaries and he said, well, we have to have a better answer on this. So it would it, the requirement to keep the public informed meant that the government would perform more efficiently because we had to have better answers. And that, that, that that's so fundamental to me that like, you know, the, the getting the accurate, truthful information together uh, and really figuring out how to explain the policy uh, that's what it's all about. I mean, and and my my anecdote would be: I remember I stayed up all night one night because we were getting ready to promulgate. This goes way back in history, but we were going to promulgate a new federal regulation that was going to regulate uh, cigarettes. And it and and the theory was that the cigarette was actually a medical device and should be regulated like other medical devices because it was designed to introduce a dose of a drug, nicotine, into the human body. So that, the, the whole, that was the premise of the regulation. And it went on for pages and pages. And so I studied the thing and really worked hard on getting it. And I brought in, and I said, but you know, this is really technical. So I'm gonna bring in the Secretary of Health and Human Services who is Donna Shalala and the head of the Federal Drug Administration, David Kessler, two very, very fine people. And I said, why don't you guys come in, help explain the regulation, help answer the questions at the press corps. And they got into it, but it was so complicated that they, they quickly <laughs> went down into the weeds and the press corps is sitting there looking at me saying, what, what are they talking about? Because they couldn't follow the technical discussion that was underway. So I, I got up and I actually kicked the two of them out. And you know Donna and you probably yep. don't, you may not know David, but you know Donna well enough. Yeah. You try to like sort of elbow her out of the picture <laughs> so that I would take over the briefing. That was probably one of my more difficult moments. But I had a, a couple of the reporters came up to me afterwards and said, man, you saved that thing because it was going down here fast. Nobody could figure out what you were trying to say. So, and, and, and the important lesson there is work of government is complicated and it's not easy stuff. And we need people who will help translate the work of government into language that the American people can find accessible. 
And you don't do that if you send your press secretary out just to kind of read talking points and give a campaign speech every day or give a lecture about, you know, how bad the press is. And by the way, if you declare the press to be the enemy of the people, then you're at war. So if they fight back, you shouldn't be too surprised <laughs> about that. And, you know, the, the press corps, in my opinion, is very reluctant to take on that fight because they don't, you know, they, they have everything in the core of their being is that we're, we don't want to be part of the story. Right. But if you're declared to be part of the story because you get called fake every day and every night, and you're declared the enemy of the people, then you've got some responsibility to stick up for the institution of the free press and to stick up for the First Amendment. And, uh, you know, I, I think gradually some of our reporter friends who work at the White House are coming around to that point of view, but it does not make them comfortable because they don't, they don't believe they want to be in the argument. They're there to cover the story. But if they are the argument because if they're being attacked day in and day out, then they, they, they ought to have the right to respond, in my opinion. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it's strange times we are living in for certain, uh, Mike. It's, uh, it's definitely uh, uh, a unique period of time that I'm guessing 100 years from now, people look back and go, man, what was going on back then? <laughs> well, they'll look back further than that. They'll look back to that famous moment when Benjamin Franklin came out of the Constitutional Convention and was asked, well, what do we have? And he said, we have a republic if we can keep it. And that's the, that's the underlying question here. Are we going to be able to keep the functions and institutions that have kept this a very durable democracy? And they are fragile. And we, we are learning in the course of this administration, how fragile they can be. But the, the, we, it requires some strength. It requires recovering some muscle memory about how you actually do democracy and put that to work. And I know you've been working on that, so I give you credit for a lot of that work. But that, that that's where our hearts have to be as we kind of think ahead to the months ahead that we have uh, in our in our country. Civic engagement, for sure, really, really critical in the days, weeks, months, and years ahead. Mike, thank you so much for doing this. And uh, uh, to be continued, because uh, we just barely scratched the surface. So well, great, great, great conversation. And I know, I know how engaged you are in a lot of these issues. And I think we ought to, I think you're right. I think we have, we have to find other partners and other people who will help us continue this conversation and engage people with different points of view. I mean, you and I come from a part of the political spectrum, but there are good people on the other side that care about these things and are working on it too. Absolutely, you are so right. And uh, uh, been a pleasure. Stay safe, my friend, stay healthy and right. love, love to your family, your wonderful family. Will do. Good, good talking right, with you. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate Bye -bye. it.